So I'm going to confess something to you that I probably should not confess to you. A couple of weekends ago, Liz and I watched the Barbie movie. And um, won't lie, very entertaining, very entertaining. If you had not seen the Barbie movie, you should. But if you've seen the Barbie movie, then you know that when it begins, life is like perfect for Barbie. She wakes up, everybody's singing, all the clothes are, you know, fit, they're perfect all the time, you know, everybody is shiny, happy people holding hands in the words of R.E.M., you know, it's like, it's just, you know, it's, it's just this wonderful, amazing world to which we look at and go, not that we want to be Barbie, I mean, maybe you do, Gary, but, um, uh, you know, uh, we look at that and we're like, man, I wish life could be like that every day. I mean, don't you wish that life could just always be up and to the right? You're always, every single day is just another mountaintop experience. Everything goes right. Everybody gets along at home. Everybody gets along at work. Traffic is perfect. People actually drive correctly on the road. I mean, it is just the best day ever, every single day. That's what we want, right? But is that how life is? Of course not. We know that life isn't like that. We, we want life to be like that. But the truth is, we know that life is filled with ups and downs, with mountaintops and with valleys, with good times and with bad times, with happy times and with sad times. And sometimes things are going great and the sun is shining down on us and everything seems to be working out in our favor. And other times, man, it seems like the wheels just come off of everything and nothing seems to go right. And we're just filled with suffering and pain, and hurt, and loss, because sometimes life is great. Sometimes life hurts. I don't know if you realize this or not, but we have a number of people in our little church family who are hurting right now. Life is very painful and difficult for one reason or another. So I felt like now would be a great time for us to talk about how following Jesus, or how, how to live as followers of Jesus, when life hurts. And the reason this is important is because I don't think we're very good as followers of Jesus following Jesus when life hurts. See, for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what some people have called a theology of suffering. Now, I don't know, like, this makes you want to come back, right? <laughs> this is like, I am so encouraged. I am going to go watch Barbie now. But uh, the, we, we, we have this idea that suffering is somehow separated from what it means to follow Jesus, but a theology of suffering really shows us who God is in the midst of our suffering and how God, how, how his working intersects with our hurt and our pain and our, our suffering. And like I said, I think many of us, we don't have a very good theology of suffering. In fact, we don't have a theology of suffering at all. And that's because for some reason, I don't know why this is, I've tried to figure this out, but for some reason we think that following Jesus or being a Christian is supposed to be suffering free. Maybe somebody told you, man, if you just follow Jesus, he will make everything better. And I do think following Jesus makes life better, but that does not equate to having a suffering free life. Um, so I, I, for some reason, in the back of many of our minds... We think that as followers of Jesus, we shouldn't have a hard time, that things shouldn't be difficult, that we shouldn't get sick, or we shouldn't be depressed, or we shouldn't suffer, or we shouldn't go through hard times, especially if we're living in the middle of God's will. Have you heard somebody say, man, the best place you can be, the safest place you can be is in the middle of God's will? Tell that to Paul. You know what I mean? Tell that to some people around the world right now that are following Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And man, they are running from the law. They are hiding right now. They are struggling. Tell that to people who have been following Jesus and they just found out this past week that they have cancer. You know, We are tempted to think that somehow as Christians we are exempt from suffering. And that is not true at all. Actually, the opposite is true. What I love is when you look through the story of scripture, you discover that the Bible 
is really a collection of suffering stories. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, the Bible in those terms before, but it really is a collection of suffering stories. It's filled with the stories of faithful men and women who in spite of and sometimes because of their faithfulness to God experienced intense and immense suffering. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to look at a few of these stories and see what they have to tell us about how to live as followers of Jesus when life hurts. And today we're going to begin with the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph that's found in Genesis, the end of Genesis, found in Genesis 37. You should skip Genesis 38. It's a really weird story. Um, ask Jamie about it later. Uh, um, I still remember that hub group. Um, and, then, and then through the end of Genesis. It's not Joseph, the Jesus' dad Joseph. This is the Old Testament Joseph. If you kind of know kind of the history of the Hebrew nation... You had Abraham, who had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob, and then Jacob had 12 different sons with four different women, you know, it's a weird thing. Joseph is Jacob's 11th son. And when we're first introduced to Joseph, well, let's just say the report is not all that good. Because we're first introduced to Joseph when he's about 17 years old. And I don't know if you remember being 17 years old. But you were probably a little bit of a punk when you were 17 years old. And Joseph was a punk when he was 17 years old. Because the first thing we're told about him was that he was giving a bad report on his brothers. He's a tattletale. Now if you're one of the older brothers and your younger brother has come and given a bad report about you. How are you going to feel about your younger brother? Not very good, right? You know, well, that's kind of how it is. Well, not only did that he give a bad report to his brothers, or about his brothers, to his dad, um, he also, we're also told in the story, that uh, he is Jacob's favorite son. Now, I don't know if you know this about Levi or not, since he's here. Levi thinks he's our favorite son, because he stole our phones and typed erased his name and put favorite son in our contact lists. So that's, you know, if you say, a few years ago. It still says that. We haven't erased it yet, you know. We give him the illusion that they can feel that way about him. It's the younger son, you know. But, but, um, but he is Jacob. Joseph is Jacob's favorite son. And he's such a favorite son that his dad gives him this richly ornamented robe of all these colors. Or if you, in the words of the 70s musical, a Technicolor dream coat. And because of Joseph's privileged status, his brothers didn't just dislike him. They weren't just annoyed with him, they hated him. And he actually made it worse because he had a couple of dreams. And in these dreams, supposedly his brothers were bowing down to him. And he, as a good younger brother, went and told his brothers about this dream, which did not help the relationship. In fact, it made the relationship more contentious and more hateful. Well, the story goes on with Joseph that we're told that sometimes later his brothers were out grazing their father's flocks near Shechem, and Jacob decided to send Joseph to check up on his brothers, like a parent-sanctioned tattletale trip is really what this was. And so Joseph went to check out on his brothers and discovered that they weren't in Shechem where they were supposed to be. They were actually in Dotham, and so he is approaching them, and we read this in Genesis 37. It says this, But they saw him, they being the older brothers, they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Now, I'm sure that if you have a sibling, that you sometimes fought with your sibling. You guys probably had arguments. You probably got in trouble for fighting at times, you know. You, there were times where you didn't like your sibling because they got something that you didn't get. But let's just say you weren't this hateful towards your siblings. Or at least I hope you weren't or aren't this hateful towards your siblings. Because these brothers hated Joseph so much that they wanted to kill him. They wanted just to get him out of the family altogether. Well... It goes on and says that Reuben, who was the oldest brother, I guess he felt a little bit of guilt about killing his brother. He said, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the hole instead, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, we'll just let him die in there over a long period of time instead of killing him and throwing him in there. It's basically what he's saying. But he felt a little bit guilty. He was going to come back and rescue him later on, um, I guess, to help his dad out. I, I don't know. Well, they listened to Reuben. They ripped off his Technicolor dream coke. They threw him in the pit. And then they sat down to eat. 
But while they were eating, some Ishmaelite traders came by on their way to Egypt. And these brothers, who hated their younger brother Joseph, came up with an ingenious plan. Instead of killing their brother, I mean, after all, he is their own flesh and blood. Let's just sell him into slavery, which really isn't a bad deal. You're going to profit off of someone that you hate and get him out of your life. And so that's what they did. They sold their brother for 20 shekels of silver, which two shekels of silver per person. Pretty good deal for them. And these traders took Joseph to Egypt and eventually sold him to a guy by the name of Potiphar. And You know who Potiphar was. Everybody knows who Potiphar was. He was one of Pharaoh's officials. He was the captain of the guard. He was a high-ranking officer in Pharaoh's kind of um, court. Well, at this point in Joseph's story, I don't think any of us would look at it and go, man, things are going great for that guy. All of us would look at that and go, I'm so glad that's not me. I mean, when you compare your problems to Joseph, I mean, your problems probably seem a little bit small because Joseph, not only is he hated by his brothers, not only is he wanting, not only did they want to kill him, but he's just been sold as a slave, as property, thousand miles away, basically, in Egypt to Potiphar. And, um, and so that's where I want to kind of pick up this story reading in Genesis chapter 39. Look at what it tells us. It says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And then we read this. This is crazy. The Lord was, what's that word? With, with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. I want to pause here for just a minute because that doesn't seem to fit with the story. That doesn't seem to fit especially with our theology of suffering. That doesn't seem to fit with how we think God works. The Lord was with Joseph. In other words, in the middle of this horrible situation that Joseph found himself in, where not only was he hated by his brothers who wanted to kill him, but he, they, he was, had been sold as a slave... In Egypt, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, if you're honest, I think at this point in the story, you kind of want to raise your hand and go, "Um, that's just not right. The Lord was not with Joseph. If the Lord was with Joseph, then he would be back home with mom and dad, and these brothers that wanted to kill him would be the ones who were slaves in Egypt. If God was with Joseph, then good things would happen to the good guys, and bad things would happen to the bad guys. That's what we think a lot of times, right? You don't realize it, but you're a closet, karma-believing Hindu that thinks that good things should happen to good guys and bad things to happen to bad guys. That's a Hindu philosophy. The complete opposite is what we read in the Bible, and the opposite is exactly what's happening here. Good things are happening to the bad guys, and bad things are happening to the good guy. The Lord was with Joseph. It just doesn't seem to make sense, but maybe you felt that way before. Maybe you felt like, God, I've been faithful. God, I've been good. God, I did everything you told me to do. I did all that you wanted me to do. Why is it that everything seems to fall apart? And that person I know who doesn't do anything you want them to do, they're not following you. They could care about you. They couldn't care about you at all. And everything is going perfect for them. I mean, what's going on? The Lord was with Joseph. This is where we want to just say, I don't think so, God. That doesn't seem right. That That definitely doesn't seem very loving. It doesn't seem like you. The Lord was with Joseph. See, I think if the Lord was with Joseph, when his brothers tried to sell him into slavery, there would have been this voice from heaven that said, hey, get your hands off that kid. You heard about his dreams, right? I mean, leave him alone. But that's not what happened. See, I also think if the Lord was with Joseph, then why did any of these things happen? I think it's a mystery. I love that we just sang that at the beginning, in the middle of the mystery. Sometimes we just don't understand. And this phrase, the Lord was with Joseph, kind of messes with what we think about God a lot of times. It messes with our theology. It messes with how we think God works. And yet, we're told, and we'll see, we're going to be told multiple times in this story, that the Lord was with Joseph. This phrase is really the point of this amazing story. The Lord was with Joseph. Let that sink in as we continue reading. He goes on and says, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Now remember, he prospered as a slave. So when you think of prosper, that's not what 
was happening with him necessarily. He just had favor with his master, the one who owned him. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. It goes on. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant, which is pretty awesome. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And then it goes on and says this. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had not what Joseph had, not on Joseph, but on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And then it says this. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. I just find this fascinating because it's as if, it's as if the Lord was with Joseph, but he blessed Potiphar. That's a little disturbing, but that's what the story tells us. Because Joseph, remember, he's still a slave. God's with him, but he's still a slave. Well, Joseph's story is far from over if you know how it continues. You know that he, while he's working as a slave in Potiphar's house and managing kind of Potiphar's household, the wife of Potiphar starts to notice how attractive Joseph is and um, starts to hit on him which is, let's just say, a little bit awkward. But we're told that day after day, she kept trying to hit on him for maybe what could have been years. She just kept hitting on Joseph and kept hitting on Joseph and trying to get him to go to bed with her. And, and day after day, he refused, saying, how could he do such a wicked thing against God? And how could he do such a wicked thing against his Egyptian master? But one day, Joseph found himself alone in the house with this woman, and she jumped him, and he ran. He ran so fast that she grabbed his cloak and he ran out of the house stark naked, which, let's just say, didn't make things look all that good for Joseph because Potiphar's wife was so embarrassed by Joseph's rejection and his integrity that she screams, she falsely accused him of assault. And then we read this in verse 16. It says, she kept his cloak beside her until her master, his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave that you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. It goes on. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger, to which some people think he burned with anger towards his wife because he knew what kind of a woman she was, which is possible. Because if he burned with anger towards Joseph for taking advantage of his wife, he probably would have had him killed because he, he knew something was going on there. But it says this, instead of killing him, it says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So get this, Joseph's story so far in life. He goes from being his dad's favorite son to being hated by his brothers to being thrown in a pit, left to die by his brothers to being sold into slavery by those same brothers to being a slave in the home of, Pharaoh, or of Potiphar in Egypt to being falsely accused of trying to take advantage of Potiphar's wife to being now thrown into prison. Let's just say it seems as if nothing good is going, or nothing is going good for Joseph, even though he was trying to follow God, even though he was trying to do the right thing. He didn't want to sin against God by taking advantage of Potiphar's wife. He didn't want to disrespect his master. Nothing seemed to go right for Joseph, even though he was trying to do the right thing. Thing himself but look at what we read next this is crazy but while Joseph was there in prison the Lord was with him now I'm thinking if the Lord was with Joseph he wouldn't be in prison right I mean that's probably what we're all thinking but the truth is what the text tells us is the Lord was with Joseph in prison I was thinking about some of the things that some of you are going through, some of the hurts of life. And I think that sometimes when life hurts, it can feel like a prison, right? We, when whatever's going on is so heavy and so hard and so tough, it can feel like we're trapped. It can feel like things have gone from bad to worse. And 
when we're in that place, it can re be really hard to feel as if God is with us. But this tells us that while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. It goes on, the story continues. He showed him kindness, which is odd, and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. It goes on. So when the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the so the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. Continues, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success at whatever he did. Once again, we read that phrase that the Lord was with. Joseph as he was a slave in the house of Potiphar the Lord was with Joseph as he was in prison here the Lord was with Joseph and showed him kindness now we don't think that's how things are supposed to work because we equate the kindness of God with good things and sure in the story Joseph had favor in the eyes of Potiphar he had favor in the eyes of the prison warden but he was still a slave and he was still in prison I, um, I love the New Living Translation. That's the one that I'm using for my Bible reading right now. And I love how it translates verse 21. I want to show that to you because I think this is has where I want us to camp out and finish out today. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. Will you read that out loud with me? But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. Let's read it one more time. Get it sunk into our brains. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. The reason I want to show you this verse in this translation is because I think that this is our takeaway from this story. Whenever life hurts, whatever we're going through, it's an opportunity for us to remember that the Lord is with us. And it is also an opportunity for God to show his faithful love to us. Let that sink in for just a minute. Whenever life hurts, it is an opportunity for you and for God. It's an opportunity for you to remember that regardless of your circumstances, that the Lord is still with you. But it's also an opportunity for God to show his faithful love to you because let's be honest when things are great do you really need God to show you his faithful love when things are going perfect do you even need God to be with you see we usually when things are going great that's when we forget a lot of times but when life hurts it's an opportunity for us to remember that the Lord is with us regardless of our circumstances and it's an opportunity for God to show his faithful love to us in spite of our circumstances. Now, I know if you're like me, you might be thinking, well, that sounds all well and good, but this was just for Joseph. I mean, we're reading Joseph's story here. I'm not Joseph. This was just the story for way back then, and this is not really relevant for me. But I want to show you one more verse. This is actually the final thing that Matthew records Jesus saying. The last thing that he records of Jesus' words. Look at what Matthew says is the last thing that Jesus says. And be sure of this. This is Jesus speaking. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you know what this is right here? This is a promise from Jesus. Not just to those disciples who he was talking to that day, but to all of us who call ourselves his disciples. It's a promise that says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the age of time and that's where I want to leave us today that when life hurts we need to discipline ourselves to remember that the Lord is with us and that his faithful love is available to us why because Jesus promises it you remember what Jesus is one of his names was we celebrate that at Christmas Emmanuel remember what Emmanuel means God with us and then Jesus here says, I will be with you 
always, not just sometimes, always. And then if you flip over to the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that it's quoting God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, I think it's easy to forget that the Lord is with us. But the point of this story that we're looking at today is that in the middle of life hurt, life's hurts, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned us, but it is an opportunity to remind ourselves that the Lord is with us. And that's what I want to encourage you to hold on to today. See, I don't know what's going on. I know what's going on in some of you, but I don't know what's going on in all of your lives. But I heard somebody say one time that all of us are either coming out of a hurt, going into the hurt, or in the middle of a hurt. Thanks for coming today. It's good news. Uh, but, but it's true, right? Because that's how life works. It's filled with ups and downs, good and bad, happy and sad, mountaintops and valleys. And in the middle of those times when life hurts, we need to make sure we hold on to this promise that the Lord has not abandoned us, but he is with us, which leaves us with a choice to make. I heard this question a few years ago, I think from Andy Stanley, I can't remember exactly, but I just, I made note of it. I thought it was such an important question. It says, am I going to respond to life's hurts by my ability to interpret circumstances, or am I going to respond by remembering that God is with me? See, I think all of us have a choice to make. Am I going to respond by going, oh, woe is me, or why is this happening, or, oh, Forget you, God. This is how it's going to be. Or am I going to respond by remembering that in the middle of life's hurts, the Lord is with me? I think Joseph is a great example for us to follow. Um, I also think that remembering that God is with us, it can change everything. It changes our perspective. It gets our vision off of what's going on and onto the one who is with us in the middle of all that's going on. So my question for you today is how can you remember that the Lord is with you? When you do that, you open up the door and give God an opportunity to show his faithful love to you. One more thing. Can you put that verse 21 up there from the the living one more time? couple of slides back. Nope, nope. Go, uh, the, yep, that's it. That little phrase, faithful love. We may do a series on this one time. Um, I wasn't even going to talk about this, but I just want to. It's the Hebrew word chesed. Can you say that with me? Chesed. You got to have that chesed, okay? Don't look at somebody else when you're saying it, okay? <laughs> it's not going to, it's going to get all over the glasses. Chesed, okay? It, um, it's a word that actually is used to describe God all throughout the Old Testament. That passage in um, Exodus chapter 34 where it says the Lord is compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger, um, abounding in love and faithfulness. That chesed is one of the words that's used right there. I just like to say chesed. Um, but uh, it, it actually is horribly difficult to translate into the English language. Sometimes it's translated as loving kindness or loyal love or faithful love. But a better understanding of this is chesed actually is the kind of love that a parent has in them that would cause them to run into a burning building to save their child when they know that they're probably going to die. That's the faithful love that God wants to show you. In fact... That's the faithful love that God has shown you with Jesus who entered into the burning building of our world that was destroyed by sin and offered himself as a sacrifice to pay the price for that sin. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks, but we actually have a God who suffered on our behalf and is well acquainted with suffering. And he wants you to know that he is with you and wants to continue to show his faithful love 
to you. Why don't you close your eyes? I want to give you an opportunity just to remember right now that the Lord is with you. And so I just want you to say silently, the Lord is with me. Just dwell on that. Contemplate that for a few seconds. The Lord is with me. Heavenly Father, I don't think that I or most of us in this room really have a great theology of suffering. Sometimes we're mistaken about how you work. And we're mistaken because we base our beliefs on our circumstances. Or we base our beliefs about you on our feelings. Instead of basing our beliefs about what you say about yourself and your word. And your word tells us that you are with us in life's hurts. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you that you are always with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And my prayer for those who are suffering and hurting right now, who are a part of our church family, is they would experience your presence with them and that it would be deeper and stronger than a feeling. I don't want them to feel your presence. I want them to experience your presence. Thank you for being with us and for showing us your faithful love. We don't want to miss that, God. Thanks for the story of Joseph, for what it teaches us. Continue to make us more like you. It's in Jesus' name, amen.